Have you ever watched a human play baseball? It's fascinating. You really should. So much of what humans do is just incomprehensible to us. And a lot of the other stuff can be, well, disturbing. Dig into the background of a lot of human customs, and it's not unlikely you'll find it somehow traces back to killing, either prey animals or each other. But baseball? Baseball is just fun. It exists for no other reason than because a human picked up a stick one day and thought it would be a laugh to see how far he could hit stuff with it. I saw my first baseball match while I was a researcher on Miyayan 4. Now that I think about it, I guess I've spent most of my life seeking out all the fascinating things the galaxy has to offer. Miyayan 4 is a long way from Homeworld, but it's always been of huge interest to our scientists, not just because of the rich diversity of life there, but because there are so many evolutionary parallels with our own biosphere. Nothing nearly intelligent enough to be classed as sentient, but there are avian species in the jungles that wouldn't look out of place flying above the forests of Homeworld. Of course, that also makes it dangerous. There are a lot of predators on Miyayan 4, and unfortunately, we Amiya bear a striking resemblance to many of their natural prey species. It makes it very hard to study something when you look like it's dinner. We built the research cities to provide safe bases for long-term study. Outside the few dozen square miles of their carefully sterilized safe zones, we've preserved the rest of the planet exactly as it was when we discovered it. Protected by walls that dig deep into the earth and electrified nets that cover the sky, the millions of researchers and their support staff are able to conduct their business without worrying that they'll contaminate the environment or that the environment will do something unpleasant to them in return. Amia are not the only species to have taken an interest in the verdant biosphere of Miyayan 4, however. The research cities have permanent embassies from the Tok Tok, the UNK, and the Upau Rokvau. The latter presented a considerable engineering challenge given that they like an ambient temperature above 250 degrees. Miyayan 4 also sees visiting research teams from many more species, including humans. That caused some controversy at first. Why bother with all the elaborate security precautions people asked if you're just going to invite a bunch of predators in? The debate over accepting a human delegation went on for years. Ironically, in the end, the first humans to set foot on Miyayan 4 weren't even scientists, but stranded spacefarers who'd been picked up by one of our resupply freighters. North Point City hosted them. The freighter captain vouched for them, and in any case, they were already there, so it wasn't like there was much of a choice. But their sojourn passed completely uneventfully, which convinced a lot of the skeptics. And so the first human research mission to Miyayan 4 was approved. I didn't have much contact with them at first. They spent their first few months in North Point City, and I was living in Easterly City at the time. I know they could have been given more imaginative names. That's what happens when your colony has nothing but scientists. But the humans were here to get a broad overview of the planet. And I think they were almost as interested in us as the native wildlife. So after three months, they moved to Easterly. Even then, I didn't see much of them. There was a fuss when they first arrived, but I was too busy cataloging the new beetle species brought in by the latest expedition to the highlands and barely noticed. Then one day I was stretching my wings. All right, my supervisor had ordered me to get out of the lab and get some fresh air. When I saw one of them wandering around near the perimeter wall. I was a hundred meters up, so he didn't notice me at all. And I thought nothing of it at first. Then curiosity got the better of me. What was he doing out there, just walking around? There's a space of several hundred meters between the wall and the city limits. Kept empty of everything but grass for security reasons. In the event of a breach, the zappers need a clear field of fire. I couldn't think what a human would be doing out there. So being a scientist, I did what any scientist would do and decided to gather more data. Which is to say, I started following him. I must have been flying above him for half an hour and still none the wiser. In fact, I became so engrossed that I almost hit the protective netting, which would have ended very badly for me. The nets are hung with flashing red lights to warn approaching shuttles and careless Amia, but never underestimate the obliviousness of scientists. I was just about to give up when he waved at me. Up until that point, I thought I was being subtle and that he hadn't seen me following him, but evidently not. It was tempting to just fly off, 
But I decided that if I could find the courage to go on expeditions into the uncharted wilderness of Miayin 4, where you're never more than a few meters away from something that wants to eat you, I could handle talking to a human. Probably. Yes, I hesitated for a moment or two, but as usual, my scientific curiosity was stronger than instinctive caution. I landed a few meters away from him. I know now that he's not particularly tall or heavy for a human, and that the bald patch on top of his head is a sign of aging rather than a fashion statement. But at the time, he looked quite intimidating. He said something, and it was only then I realized, fool that I was, that I didn't have anything capable of translating human speech with me. Which was actually an interesting way to encounter humans for the first time, because it meant I could listen to the slow, basso rumble of his voice without any preconceived notions and experience their language. Anyway, that's not particularly important. Fortunately, he had his own translator with him, and although it was an inferior human version, it served well enough. He introduced himself as Dr. Martin Scott and politely inquired in a roundabout way why I was spying on him. I explained that I was simply curious why he was wandering around an area which, to an Amia, held absolutely nothing of interest. As it turned out, it contained nothing of interest to a human either. He, too, was simply getting some exercise in the fresh air in the one place there was plenty of open ground. We tend to forget that our cities aren't designed with walking in mind. Everything on Mian 4 is disability regulation compliant, of course, but it still isn't easy to get around on foot. So he'd come out to the perimeter to stretch his legs. He mentioned offhand that he thought it was a shame that we hadn't done more with the space. I almost didn't ask what he meant. More interested in topics like his field of research and what he thought of Mian 4. But again, curiosity got the better of me. And that was when he started talking about making it into a baseball diamond. Which confused me immensely at first, as evidently his translator wasn't fully adapted to AMIA languages and conveyed the term as home sphere carbon lattice. A little more questioning, however, revealed that it was a sort of game where players hit a roughly spherical ball with a stick and run around a rhomboid shaped track. It soon became clear that Dr. Scott was quite a fan of baseball and happy to explain the rules and the concept behind it at some length. The idea of an adversarial team game was novel to me. We Amia have games, of course, but usually each player competes for their own personal glory. For example, that ubiquitous children's game, Keep Up. Played with a hand-sized sack filled with sawdust, each player is given a number. Number one flies up high with the sack and drops it, and two has to catch it before it hits the ground. Two then flies up high and drops it for three to catch, and so on. Players are out if they let the sack touch the ground or they get too tired to keep flying, and the winner is the last player in the air. A simple enough concept, but few human games are played this way. Their games are usually cooperative and almost always pit one team against another. We have cooperative games too, of course, but the joint objective is always something like building the longest unbroken chain of catches rather than defeating another team. An interesting psychological distinction, and especially fascinating as it had never occurred to me before that almost all our games fall into such a narrow pattern, and there was a whole other class of sports out there I'd never even thought of. We eventually moved on to other topics, but my mind kept wheeling back around to the idea of watching a baseball game. We parted ways having developed something of a rapport, and before going back to my Beatles, I made two notes for myself. The first, to continue getting to know Dr. Scott, and the second to find out more about baseball. I would have suggested Dr. Scott and I get lunch together the next day. Well, perhaps not lunch. I don't think I'd have much of an appetite if I had to watch someone eating bits of dead animal. Something to drink, maybe. Unfortunately, however, I had another research trip out to the Highlands to look for more beetles, and you can never delay those. Shuttle schedules are decided weeks in advance, and there's always fierce competition to book them. The skies above Easterly City seem to have a constant procession of the ungainly things, and there are still never enough of them. It was such a productive trip that I spent two more days in the lab when I got back, and it was only when my supervisor once again ordered me to go outside for a bit that I remembered what had happened last time and noticed the two bits of paper stuck to my desk reminding me about Dr. Scott and baseball. I arranged to meet up with Dr. Scott that afternoon on a terrace overlooking the river just outside the city, which has some very impressive geysers courtesy of the tunnels left by the borer worms that... Anyway, 
that's not particularly important. I wanted to make it up to Dr. Scott for neglecting him, so before our meeting I made some inquiries with city maintenance, specifically concerning the capabilities of their lawnmower bots. I was able to bring good news to Dr. Scott, or Martin, as I was soon calling him, that afternoon. And even better, he was just as enthusiastic about the idea as I was. After we were done talking over the details, he went to conscript some players, and I went to write up a petition to the city council for use of a public space. And that was how we came to organize the very first game of baseball ever played on Mian 4. In fact, as far as I'm aware, it was the very first game of baseball played on any Amiya planet. So naturally, once word got around, it started attracting quite a bit of interest. I was a little worried the human players might be put off by the thought of thousands of aliens watching them. But Martin assured me that baseball was best when played with a large number of spectators. I never actually asked the other players about that, but I assumed he spoke for them. There were only just enough humans on the planet to field two teams, and of course they were all scientists like Dr. Scott. Although when I did talk to one, a Dr. Freya Sharp, she didn't actually seem enthusiastic about the idea, more like grudgingly resigned. She also warned me that a lot of them hadn't played baseball before, or at least not since childhood. But I pointed out that since no one in the audience had never watched a baseball game before, any mistakes would go unnoticed. The day we originally scheduled the match for there was heavy rain, which was annoying. But it did mean that when the skies cleared the next day, there we got an even larger number of spectators than we'd hoped for. Rain always gets the local wildlife riled up because predators can't hunt, so they become especially aggressive for the following few days, and all outbound trips have to cancel. Totally messes up the shuttle schedules, but in this case, their loss was our gain, because there were a lot of scientists around with nothing better to do. The game started well for Martin's team. Or at least, I think it did. To be honest, even though I'd read through the rules beforehand, I had no idea what was going on at first. Somehow I'd got the idea that the pitcher was trying to hit the batter with the ball, which added a frisson of danger as I'd read that the fastest baseball pitches reached almost 180 kph. That would be enough to cause fatal damage to an Amiya, but I assumed the humans knew what they were doing. At least the archive entries didn't bother to include statistics for the fatality rate. And for some human sports, they do. As I said, a lot of what humans do is disturbing. After watching for a while, two things became clear. First, that the humans were throwing a good deal slower than 180 kph, unsurprising given that they were scientists rather than professional athletes. Second, that the pitcher was trying to get the ball to the catcher standing behind the mound. The objective was to avoid interception by the batter. And it wasn't simply a matter of speed, either. By imparting spin to the ball, they could make it curve at unpredictable angles, it was, well, it was fascinating. I quickly realized that it was a game an Amiya would never be able to play. We simply don't have the hand-eye coordination to throw something that precisely, nor do we have the strength to hit a ball any respectable distance. Not to mention that even a baseball thrown by an amateur could still cause us serious injury. Yet the humans made it look so easy. Indeed, the casualness of it all surprised me. I had been expecting a degree of aggression between the teams. Humans are famously the only sentient species that regularly practices intraspecies violence. And even in a game, I'd thought I would see some aggressive posturing at the very least. The human equivalents of spread wings, fluffed up feathers, that sort of thing. But although I'm far from an expert in human body language, they all seem to be maintaining a fairly congenial attitude towards each other. They were still clearly trying hard to win. One player slid into second base very forcefully, and when he didn't get up for a moment, I was worried he'd been hurt. He got up a moment later, but it was a player from the opposing team who helped him to his feet. When one batter did get accidentally hit by the ball, the whole game stopped while the medic, the research group's doctor, who was one of the few humans on the planet not playing, examined him to make sure nothing was broken. Rather than being pleased to see someone from the opposing team put out of commission, the pitching team was just as concerned for the batter's health as his own teammates. Fortunately, he only had a bruise on his upper arm rather than a broken bone. I was quite sure most other species would have been put in the hospital by an impact like that. Well, maybe not the Upau Rokvau. One had come out of their embassy to watch the game for its own inscrutable reasons. 
Outside their native high-temperature, high-pressure environment, they wear an armored suit that can stand up to just about anything. If you've never seen one before, imagine a meter-long cone standing point-side down on ten multi-jointed legs emerging from the rim, with a small dome on top containing its sensory organs. Now encase it in titanium alloy, I heard a human refer to it as a chome snow cone with legs. I could see the bleachers it was sitting on flexing under its weight, and I was pretty sure you could throw baseballs at it all day and not make a dent. Not that it would be much good at baseball, they're quite slow. They aren't known for their sense of fun either, so I had no idea what it was getting out of watching the game. We also had spectators from beyond the walls. There was a flock of Nazia wheeling through the skies. Native predators, a little larger than an Amia at an average of 180 cm length. Carrion scavengers mostly, picking over the carcasses of the giant worms, but they will prey on anything smaller than them and are highly aggressive. They were circling, no doubt looking for the disturbed ground that presaged a worm breaching, and every few minutes they passed nearby. Once they got close enough that their shadow fell across the stands, and half the audience dived for cover on instinct. We Amia have an evolutionarily ingrained aversion to large avians. The Nazia had long ago learned to stay away from the nets, of course. Perhaps they were curious about what the wingless aliens were doing swinging sticks around. Although more likely the attraction for them was the all-you-can-eat buffet sitting in the stands. It must have been quite a frustrating few hours for them. As for myself and the other Amia in attendance, we were enjoying quite a fun afternoon. Following the example of the handful of human spectators, we soon learned to make loud, raucous noises whenever a ball was successfully hit. The bigger the distance, the louder the noise. Apparently, the game itself wasn't interesting enough for some of the children in the stands, who decided to have their own competition to see who could make the loudest, longest racket, and had to be shushed by their parents after a while. I also heard one child ask, when do the humans start attacking each other? And was very disappointed when they were told that it looked like that wasn't going to happen. Probably. One by one, the players made their way around the diamond. Martin made it all the way back to home base, but a few others on his team weren't so lucky. One made an incautious attempt to steal third base and was tagged out, and one was caught out by the pitcher, who happened to be Dr. Sharp. I started to get a sense of what humans enjoyed about the game, as you were naturally inclined to root for the players trying to make it around the diamond to get home again, but it was still confusing, as you also wanted to root for the players trying to stop them. The whole adversarial aspect never quite clicked for me, but it was amazing watching the balls soar high into the air. Hours passed, and the teams changed sides. I was having a good time, but it still felt like I was missing something fundamental about baseball. The pitcher threw, the batter hit, but surely there was more to the game than simply doing that over and over again. Instead of watching the players on the field, I started watching the humans off the field, trying to spot which bits they were focusing on. I soon realized they were paying just as much attention to the runners making their way around the diamond as the batter, who seemed to be the center of the action to me. The tension in their bodies as a runner made for the next base was visible across the bleachers. And then, it hit me. The heart of the game was about risk. Yes, it was a test of physical skill, speed, and strength, but it was the element of calculation that made it interesting. Did the player swing for the fences and risk being caught out, or did they try a more conservative punt that wouldn't advance their team as far? Did a player stay on a base where they were safe, or try to make that extra run? It was a game of measuring personal risk against collective gain, and the best players were those who tried to advance their team's score as much as possible without losing their place on the field. With this new understanding, I finally felt like I was fully able to appreciate the action. Round and round the diamond the players went, and as the final innings began to near, the score was still closely balanced between the teams. I still hadn't quite got into the adversarial spirit of the game. Really, it felt more exciting to see the highest number of runs combined between the teams, but I could at least now understand how the players were balancing staying ahead of the other team against staying in the game. The game finished after a little over two and a half hours. My friend Martin's team won by two runs. I flew over to congratulate him and found him shaking hands with Dr. Sharp. 
I inquired whether this was some form of ritual submission on her part. But no, quite the contrary. By shaking hands, both players acknowledged that the other had played well, and whether winner or loser, it had been an entertaining game. Fascinating custom. When we Amiya win something, we tend to crow about it. I'm told that when translated into some human languages that could be considered a joke, an entirely accidental pun, although I'll happily take credit slash all in all, if I had to spend a couple of hours outside the lab, there were worse ways to do it. Physical feats well beyond what we're capable of, coupled with mental strategizing that adds an unexpected layer to the game that crosses the species boundary. And for an outsider watching, a curious dichotomy between the aggressive nature of an adversarial team sport and the convivial atmosphere and mutual respect. When I told Martin how impressed I'd been with his performance, he was very self-deprecating. Only a group of amateurs knocking a ball about for a few hours, nothing on the professional leagues, and so on. He was disappointed that we hadn't got to see a home run, which is when the batter hits the ball so far it leaves the playing field entirely. True, I would have liked to see that, but in the end, the players had a good game and the spectators had an entertaining time watching them, and we both agreed that that was really the point of it all. It was then I got to see yet another interesting thing. The Upau Rokvau who had come to watch was now ambling over in our direction. Despite them having an embassy in Easterly City, I rarely saw them. For obvious reasons, they don't like to leave their environmentally controlled compound and conduct most of their research using samples brought in by AMIA teams. I had certainly never spoken to one before, but as it came ambling up, rocking back and forth on its ten spindly legs, it started talking. This seemed like a unique opportunity, so, in the interests of science, I surreptitiously recorded it. I have the audio here somewhere. Where is it? Ah, yes. Here we go. May I ask a question? It was addressing Martin, by the way. I know I should have taken a vid, but I didn't want to make things awkward, so I'll just have to explain how it went. Anyway, he looked at me and I shrugged. I had no more idea how to handle an Upau Rokvau than he did. He hesitated for a moment. A little intimidated, I thought, although with humans who can tell. Then he went ahead. Yes, please, ask away. Are you senior baseball specialist, Dr. Martin Scott? Uh, yes, I suppose so. May I ask another question? Er, yes. What skill does this training exercise develop? A fellow scientist, apparently, one with a very direct approach. Um, it's not really a training exercise, it's just a bit of fun. I suppose you could say it trains teamwork and keeps us physically fit, but mostly we do it because we enjoy it. This is interesting to me. May I ask another question? Uh, okay. Please select an emotional reference for fun in the context of baseball from the following list. Eating high-quality food, mating, escaping a predator, emerging from a successfully completed sleep cycle, building a shelter, or seeing the infinity of deep space. Interesting list, I thought although I didn't say anything. I still wonder whether it was based on how Upau Rokvau experienced the universe, or whether they determined those fundamental categories from studying all the other species in the galaxy. Martin seemed a bit nonplussed as well, but he powered through. Well, he... I don't think it's very close to any of those, maybe escaping from a predator. I've never had to run away from a tiger before, but I imagine the sense of exhilaration might be similar to winning a baseball game. This is interesting to me. I thank you for your participation in this conversation. Do you wish to ask me any questions? I was about to butt in at this point and see if I could work out what exactly the Upau Rokvau's interest in baseball was, but as soon as I opened my beak, I was drowned out by another damn shuttle going overhead. It was louder than it should have been because its air intakes were open. Normally, they close them for final approach, but its pilot must have left it on automatic. It took me a moment to remember that there were no shuttles scheduled. This must be a returning shuttle, and if it had been out during the rains, it might well be returning now because the team had run into trouble. If it was still flying on automatic, it might be because no one was in a condition to pilot it. I was about to send a message to emergency response. Just a little, you're probably on top of this, but just in case, here's a heads up. Then events overtook me. The noise of the engines must have startled the Nazia because the flock suddenly turned and shot upwards. Unfortunately, this brought it right into the path of the shuttle, which plowed right through them. Nausea, as I've mentioned, are big creatures. 
The shuttles we use on Miayan 4 are built to handle encounters with hostile wildlife and probably could have handled the impacts, but for the fact that its vents were open. Several Nazia got sucked in and this must have damaged something critical because the shuttle began to spin wildly out of control. At first, it looked like it might stay in the air. It was twisting about, leaving a trail of smoke that looked like a writhing worm up in the sky, but some of its downward thrusters were still functioning. Then another Nazia got sucked in, and a gout of flame shot out of one of its air intakes. That was when it started veering towards the city. It ripped right through the netting, clipped a communications tower, then disappeared from view. A moment later, there was an explosion, and a bright orange fireball rose from among the buildings on the side of the city nearest us. This was all horrifying enough, but at least we weren't in any immediate danger. Emergency response would be all over the crash site within moments. All we had to do was sit tight while they got the situation under control, and hope there hadn't been too many casualties. And then the flock of Nazia found the hole in the netting. The first one looked like it was following the smoke trail left by the shuttle, possibly to take revenge on the great beast that had just attacked them. The large avians are notoriously aggressive, and although vindictive requires a level of cognitive ability they aren't thought to be capable of, some of my colleagues swear that the bastards will go out of their way to get you if you piss them off. Then, more started to follow the first Nazia, spreading out over the city, inside the protective cover of the netting. May I ask a question? It was only then I realized the Upau Rokvau was still standing right next to me. It waited politely for me to answer while more and more Nazia started swarming through the smoke-filled air. Uh, yes? I agreed rather hoarsely. Was that meant to happen? I started to explain that there had been an accident, but everything was under control. I still wasn't particularly concerned for my own safety at that point. The city was equipped with zappers, AI-controlled pulse guns that could fire a charge strong enough to take down even Miayan the Four's largest native fauna. It was extremely rare that something made it past the walls and the netting, but it paid to be prepared. The Nazia would no doubt start dropping from the sky any moment. Then I noticed something. The red lights on the netting directly above us were off, which could only mean one thing. This part of the city had lost power. The shuttle must have taken out an electricity substation when it crashed, which meant that we were out in the open with large alien predators circling overhead, and we were totally defenseless. I was just starting to explain that we should probably try to find some sort of cover when the first Nazia dived. Its target was a group of children at the edge of the baseball field. Now that the game was over, they had started playing catch with one of the baseballs, or at least were trying to because Amiya are terrible throwers. They were completely oblivious to the Nazia diving towards them. I tried to call out a warning, but there was too much noise. Everyone was starting to panic, shouting questions, or simply squawking in alarm. Very unhelpful. You'd think a community of scientists would respond more rationally in a crisis. There was no way to reach the children in time. I could only watch in horror as the Nazia closed in on them. But in its eagerness for an easy meal, the Nazia had been careless. Its broad-winged shadow passed over the children, and on instinct they scattered. It may be many generations since Amiya had to worry about being hunted by the ancient predators of Homeworld, but tens of millions of years of evolution is still imprinted on our genes. When a large shadow passes overhead, you run and hide. The Nazia was too big and too slow to grab any of the children, who darted off towards the only cover nearby, the bleachers. Most of the spectators were already hiding under them. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. That just left the humans, who were still out on the field. And myself, of course. More and more Nazia were moving in our direction. I was going to tell Martin that it might be wise to take cover, but the humans seemed to be getting the idea already. They were slow, though. For all their impressive physiology, they're still flightless. I considered leaving them, but the problem with that was that I'm no spring chicken myself. I have neither the speed nor agility I did when I was younger, and if I got caught making a run for the bleachers, I would have no chance. Nausea must weigh a good 50 kilos, almost 20 more than the Amiya average. If one of them managed to pin me down, then that knife-like beak and razor-sharp claws would make short work of me. It occurred to me in that moment that the problem was not unlike baseball. Do you run for home or do you stay on your base? Out on the field, I was a target, but in a group of humans, I was one target among many. 
If I shot ahead of them, I risked being singled out, but the longer I stayed in the open, the more chance I'd be targeted. The solution in baseball was to wait until the fielders were distracted by another player, so I should wait until the Nazia made a dive at someone else. Then one of the Nazia hit Martin. While I had been distracted by the logical elegance of the game, I'd taken my eye off the ball, as it were. My friend shouted in pain, and for a moment I was torn between trying to help him and flying for cover. There was nothing I could do, however. I was no match for the large predator, and there were no weapons around. The Nazi had dug its claws into Martin's back and started trying to lift him off the ground. However, this didn't get it very far. Literally. It rose about half a meter up in the air and then dropped down again, unable to lift him any further. Martin was flailing about trying to get the thing off him, and the Nazia took exception to this and started pecking at him. Its pointed beak could have speared straight through me, but of course being flightless humans have much denser bone structure than Amia, so although it caused some deep wounds, none of them were fatal. It was at this point that Dr. Sharp came over with a baseball bat, and I learned that as far as humans are concerned, anything can be a weapon. She started hitting the Nazia, although this was difficult because it was still firmly attached to Martin, and he kept getting in the way. This led to what felt like a very long time of Martin shouting, Get it off me, get it off me, and Dr. Sharp shouting back, I'm trying, hold still, you idiot. Finally, she managed to line up a decent swing and clocked the Nazia right on the beak. It let out a squawk of outrage, but instead of turning on Dr. Sharp as I feared it might, it evidently realized it was no longer the apex predator in this scenario and beat a hasty retreat back into the air. Martin was bloodied, but still standing. Dr. Sharp started to take a look at his injuries, but I pointed out that it might be better to find shelter first. There were still plenty of Nazia circling overhead, and most of the other humans had reached the bleachers now. We were about to be the only targets left on the field. We started making for cover. And that was when I felt the shadow pass overhead, it was like time had slowed. I looked up and saw the Nazia diving down towards me. If I tried to fly to the bleachers, it would catch me. If I tried to fly anywhere else, then I'd run into one of the other Nazia. I could see the possibilities very clearly, and all of them ended up with me dead, unless the two humans with me did something. Fly with your flock and you'll always stay on course, is the Amiya saying. In human terms, I was relying on my team to help me. Martin noticed that I'd stopped before he saw the Nazia. When he followed my line of sight and realized what was wrong, he stepped in front of me and raised his bat. The Nazia was heading straight for us. Every nerve in my body was screaming at me to fly for cover. But I am a scientist, and while instinct has its uses, I am first and foremost a rational being. Although I won't lie, I did almost pass out as those enormous talons came hurtling towards me. As the moment of impact neared, time almost seemed to stop for a moment, and in that moment, Martin swung his bat. The Nazia exploded in a cloud of feathers. One moment death was descending towards us on black wings, the next its body was rolling to a stop in the dirt while its head... You know, now that I think about it, that must have been a home run. We made it to the bleachers, and I was pleased to see that although there were some other humans with cuts and bruises, it didn't seem like anyone had been seriously hurt. So far, the Nazia were still lurking right above us. A couple of Amiya wanted to make a run for the nearest building to see if they could find help, but I strongly advised them that we were safest where we were. I looked around to make sure no one had been left behind, and that was when I realized that we had all completely forgotten about the Upau Rokvau. It was still out there. Upau Rokvau are not fast, and it was trundling along towards the bleachers at a leisurely pace which meant it was still a couple of minutes away from reaching safety. I had no idea if it even understood what was going on, but there was no way I could get to it. I tried to call to it to tell it to hurry up, but unfortunately the Nazia had already seen it. One Nazia landed on top of it. Its legs bent under the weight, but it carried on walking, seemingly oblivious. The Nazia didn't seem to know what to do next, and for a few moments it just sat there, being carried along by the calmly plodding Upau Rokvau. Then, the Nazia started pecking at the sensory dome. The Upau Rokvau paused, as if contemplating the problem, seemingly in no hurry while the Nazia tried to crack it open like a nut. Then one of its legs reached upward and prodded the Nazia once, twice, three times. 
However, trying to gently nudge the massive predator into leaving it alone didn't do have any effect. Then I saw the bright flash of an electric arc, and that definitely worked. The Nazi leapt up into the air and flew off with a surprising turn of speed for something so large. The Upau Rukvau continued ambling on, unmolested, until it reached the bleachers. When it got to us, it apologized for using force against the native wildlife in contravention of guidelines for preserving the natural environment. We were able to shelter under the bleachers until emergency response sent some shuttles out to get us, which was, in my view, unforgivably slow. It took them almost half an hour. Several Nazi landed and tried to get under the bleachers, but there were 20 humans with baseball bats waiting for them. The smart ones flew off as soon as they saw that a human coming towards them, but nausea aren't the brightest creatures, and unfortunately greed often overcame caution. Unfortunate for the Nazia, that is. Diving out of the air, they're terrifying, but on the ground, they're just as ungainly as we are, and no match for a human. Martin described beating them to a pulp as a bit of a shame and not very scientific. I'm not sure I quite share his view that they are magnificent creatures, although that may be due to my genetic bias against large predatory avians. Personally, I'll stick to my beetles. Dr. Sharp, who became a bit belligerent after one of the Nazi bitter, described it as satisfying. Anyway, after emergency response got us on the shuttles, we were taken to secure buildings where we could wait while they cleaned up the mess. And that's the story of the first baseball match I ever went to. It was far from the last. Despite the unfortunate interruption at the end, we'd all had such a good time that we made it a weekly event while the humans were on Mian 4. After they left, I kept up my correspondence with Martin, and when I came to visit him on Earth, he introduced me to some professional baseball players, and that's when I really started learning the game. What? Oh, you were originally asking about the time Easterly City was overrun by huge carnivorous aliens. Right. Well, there's really not much more to tell. They got the zappers back online after about two hours, if I remember correctly. Most of the citizens were able to shelter in place, so there weren't many casualties. One or two deaths, a couple of maulings, and the poor shuttle crew, of course. Now, as I was saying, the really interesting thing about baseball is, hey, where are you going? 